My name is Maylene Plummer, and on behalf of PwC and Global Woman, we would like to open this hui customarily with our nation's native tongue and custom. To begin, I will have an incantation of words to clear the pathway ahead for us all. Then I will have a series of acknowledgements. The first are our deities. Thereafter, I will turn to those gone beyond the veil, our beloved. And I will also acknowledge those who are sick with COVID. I will then turn to us, the living, and acknowledge our chairperson of PwC, our moderator, our CE of Global Woman, our panel, and to the audience. To finish, I will introduce myself and uh, end with a support song that acknowledges motherhood. Noreira. Parakia Tato. Waka taka ta ho ki te ru. Waka taka ta ho ki te tonga. Ki a ma ki na ki na ki uta. Ki a ma tara tara ki tai. E hi a ki a na ti a te kura. He tio, he hoka, he ho hu. Hu ri ki waka maua ki a teina. Ho mi e, hu i e. Ta'ikiya Hairi atura, hairi atura, takoto mai ra. E nga tangata e mawiwi ana ki te matukaraina. Piki, piki, piki te ora. Ha piti hono tātai hono, te hunga mate ki te hunga mate. Ha piti hono tātai hono, te hunga ora ki te hunga ora. Ki a koutou, ki wa hui hui mai nei. Tēnā koutou katoa. And to Tia Mana or PWC, a e Kieran Blakey, here now, Koe. No, if I could too fitter, to who we know, or Tinera, Tino, Tino, Nui, Tiao, Hera, Kia, Faka Nui, in a Faka Tu Takitanga, or Nawahine, a e Kai Fakarite, a Kirsten, Lucy, here now, Koe. No, if Fakarite Tereo, Te Tere. Me te whakahaere ina kōrero, ki a mārama te papa, ki a ora, ki a whai hua, ki a whai wahi tēnā koe. O tēnei he mihi, mai a oha ki a koutou nā rangatira e noho nei ki te pai pai tapu, te pai whire, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Tokorua, nga kōrero a rotorata, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. E te kai whakahaere mātua o PwC o me Global Woman, tēnā kōrua. Ko tēnā he mihi atu ki a koe a Agnes Naira, tēnā koe te wahi nē tō. Ka huri a hau ki a koutou, te meninga, nā maunga whakahu, nā awa koe ora, nā hāpuri haua, te ope paruru, nā hāpore ki nā tīna nā rohe, nā tauera, Nga hau e whā. Mā te whāna o PwC me Global Woman. No mai, whakatau mai ki te hui nei. Ko wai a hau. Ki te taha ho tōku pāpa nō Ngāti Hine te iwi. Ko pōeru e te maunga. Ko taumārere te awa. Ko tūmā tauinga te marai. Ko baker te whānau. Ki te taha o tōku māma nō Ngāti Pākia a hau. I tuku waki ia i te whanga nui a tara. Noku, me tuku hoa tānei, tokorua nga tamariki. E mahi ana a hau i rotu i te roku o PwC ki mana kura. Kati. I rotu i tēnei ao hurihuri, me tau toko te kaupapa. Te whiri wero, ko whiri a wero. Nō reira e te whānau ko hui hui mai, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou 
katoa. Kawaita ki a Maria ki nei fakai. Waka mea mai te whare tangata. I ne pūrotu, i ne nākau, i ne rangi māri nei. Ko te whaea, ko te whaea o te au, o te au. Tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's International Women's Event um, held on behalf of Global Women. My name's Karen Blakey, Chair at PwC. It is fantastic that we're actually still able to gather. It's a real shame we couldn't obviously be together in, in person today, um, but I think with COVID, we're all getting used to working differently. And I suppose when you think about diversity and inclusion, actually these virtual events are inviting more people into our family. So that's actually something really special. So when we think about today's theme around choose to challenge, it is truly inspiring. How do we all make a difference? And we're going to hear a lot more about that today. And as I was preparing for this session, I reflect a little bit on, on my journey and my story. And when I started out in a professional services firm all those years ago, um, I couldn't see any female partners. I couldn't see any woman with children. I'm now chair of PwC, have two university age children. And that's all down to what other people have done. So how can we continue that journey and continue that story um, so that others will look back and see that we left our footprint as well? So what I want to do today, I'll just give you a little bit of background on International Women's Day, just so you've got a little bit of context of the history. Then I'll just talk a little bit about today's session and what's going to be covered by the panel. And then finally, I'd like to introduce um, Kirsten Lacey, who's our facilitator for today. And then Kirsten will introduce the panel herself. So when you reflect back, International Women's Day uh, started well over a century ago, so 19,011, that does sound like a long time ago. And the original intention was there around how do we celebrate the social, economic, cultural, and political advancement of women? How do we help women really make a difference? And that was a global initiative at the time. So the, the, spin, the sort of spin on that for this year is how do you choose to challenge? How do you take this forward in your own capacities? So today's panel discussion, I suppose, is, is a challenge to the world in terms of how do we step up? How do we lead? How do we come? We've come a long way. How do we go further? And I think all of the panelists today will reflect on their journeys, their stories with the corporates that they work with and the communities and the societies around the journeys that they've been on. And that will be hugely valuable for everyone to, to hear about. So just a little bit of history on Kirsten Lacey, who's our facilitator today. So Kirsten is the Auckland Art Gallery Director and has been in that role since 2019. Um, Kirsten is very, very educated and she has a long, long list of achievements. Um, they include a Masters of Arts in History and Curatorship, and she also has a Masters in Business Administration. She began her career as an artist, so very much understands the skills and attributes of artists. And she's curated for the art galleries both at Ballarat and Shepparton in Australia and she held the director role at Shepparton for eight years. So she is now, in, and she was also de Deputy Director of the National Gallery of Australia. So that's a little bit of the history on Kirsten, and I will now hand over to her so she can introduce you to the panel. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, also a thank you, Maylene, um, 
for your wonderful welcome. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Melody and Donna, who's currently translating for us. They'll be flipping um, between each other over the course of our hui today. I'd also just like to acknowledge Agnes, who's extended the invitation to our panel and put together this incredible esteemed group of individuals that it's been my absolute pleasure to connect with over the last uh, week or two. Firstly, um, I will introduce um, each of our panelists in turn and also invite them to turn on their microphones and just share a reflection on what is on their mind this International Women's Day 2021. We've prepared a series of um, topics uh, which we've been exploring together uh, to share with you. Um, and I think we're gonna have a really, really exciting and engaging conversation across this um, a group of individuals. Firstly, perhaps if I throw to you, um, Martin. Martin is um, the chair of New Zealand Cricket, um, currently board director also of Women in Sport New Zealand, um, and also um, on the board of the International Sport Broadcaster. Uh, previously, a long career as a, as a lawyer for 20 years, um, and um, in previous roles was also the CEO of the World Cup. Um, Martin has um, influenced and been influenced by um, a, a substantial and important report called the Women in Cricket Report 2016. Um, Martin, welcome. I um, invite you to turn your camera and microphone on um, and, um, and share a little bit about your journey this far. Uh, Kira, uh, Kirsten, and good evening, everyone. Um, it's, it's actually really neat to be involved tonight because it it sort of validates the fact that um, cricket has managed to get itself into a position where it can participate in a much wider conversation with a degree of confidence, although still with a, a fairly strong streak of humility um, about what we've been doing. Um, my life has been in sport um, on and off the field and uh, but, but as Kirsten said, I think one of the most important things, and particularly in relevance to tonight, occurred in 2016, where as a member of the New Zealand Cricket Board, we decided that we needed to um, not just examine, but actually draw to the surface the uh, health of the engagement that those running cricket in New Zealand had with women and girls. We actually knew the answer uh, before we started on this, but we decided that uh, we needed someone independent to be resourced to undertake a really extensive uh, investigation to draw um, all of the evidence to the surface, including the most uncomfortable evidence. And for us then to uh, unreservedly put that into the public domain and to use uh, the findings of, of that report as a catalyst for us actually doing something about what we knew was a major problem in the game, which is that actually those running cricket in New Zealand were useless at meaningfully, um, productively engaging with women and girls across a pretty wide spectrum. Uh, Sarah Beeman uh, did the report and she didn't hold back. And at the end of it, um, she did uh, exactly what we thought, which was to uh, effectively tell cricket that we were not doing uh, at all well in this area. And there was a series of recommendations that came out of that. Um, the primary recommendation was uh, start with governance. We have a situation where through a network of cricket associations across New Zealand, we have uh, about 31 associations and a total of about 220 odd uh, board directors of various sorts. Um, it, it, when Sarah did the report, out of those 220, 11 of those were female, 11 out of 220. Um, so it's not surprising that she told us to start with governance and that we, we, that's what we did. And there's been a major project that started in early 2017 that has been uh, going forth and that really um, is where I came back into the picture here. And I think it, it partly a guilty conscience for having neglected um, uh, this whole issue when I had the opportunity as the Chief Executive of New Zealand Cricket to do something about it and, and I didn't. 
And secondly, because I could see what I thought was a really positive future available to cricket if we could get, get to grips with this. And so for the last four years, I've been heavily involved in, in this area, co-leading what cricket in New Zealand has been doing here. Um, we've made a, a significant amount of progress um, in governance and in other areas. Uh, we've got a long, long way to go. Um, but Kirsten, the, you know, when I reflect back on it, the sort of things that might come up later in this conversation today are maybe some learnings, experiences from actually how to break through the barriers that in, initially existed once New Zealand Cricket had embark embarked on, on this project. Um, and as part of a change process, how we could avoid this being flavour of the month for the first few months and then basically falling into um, a fairly static sort of process and trying to ensure that, that the momentum was kept going um, continually over years, not just weeks or months. Um, and as part of that, trying to deal with those resistors who didn't believe in this and who were continually asking for proof that what we were doing was actually working. So those, those were the types of challenges we were continually meeting over the last few years. And then finally, I think, uh, and, and hopefully this might come up at some stage in the, in the um, conversation tonight, was recognising not just the importance of having female leaders driving this, but actually uh, the support of male champions and the really effective role that male champions can play in um, creating change and then ensuring that, that the momentum of change continues throughout. So I guess as I reflect on, on International Women's Day today, I think there's a mixture of satisfaction that we've taken on the challenge, but uh, realisation of the reality of the fact that we're really only uh, part way into this and, and it'll keep going for a long time yet before we get to the sort of place where I think we can say that we have achieved uh, exactly what we need to have achieved when we see that. Thanks so much, Martin. And it's great to have two male champions with us today. Um, you mentioned there were 11 um, uh, women directors when um, the report was released in 2016. And, and you've certainly championed that to move it to 70 uh, now, I think um, you, you mentioned to us. We, lots of lots you've touched on there, women in sport. We've got Paula, of course, on the on the hui with us today, a Paralympian. Um, I'm sure dying to pick up um, some of those threads. Um, and of course, the question around quotas, which keeps coming up um, in our conversations. I wanted to invite, um, I wanted to introduce now Melissa Ross. Melissa is, um, was the first female to join the New Zealand Navy and has been in the Navy for 28 years and is now, of course, the Deputy Chief of the Navy. Um, welcome, Melissa. Um, a mother of two boys, as am I, um, and um, uh, with a background in marine uh, mechanical engineering. I wanted to invite you, uh, Melissa, to say a few words about yourself and what's on your mind uh, for IWD21. Nga mihi nui, Kirsten, tēnā koutou katoa to everyone out there. Ko te ramaroa te maunga, Ko Ferina ki te awa, ko nā tuki matafaurua te waka, ko pā te aroha te marae, ko te hekatu te hapu, uh, ko ngā puhi te iwi, uh, ko Melissa Ross ni kai o toko ingoa. Um, I am a Commodore in the Royal New Zealand Navy. I wasn't the first female in the Navy, um, not by a long shot, uh, and I do want to acknowledge all those that uh, started on this journey well before me and uh, carved the path that I'm now following in. Uh, I am based in uh, Wellington and I took over the role as the Deputy Chief of the Navy in December 2019. I've been in the Navy now for 28 years and I did start as a Marine Engineering Officer uh, on our steamships uh, back then and they were steam powered. So uh, a hot and uh, dirty place to work for a female 
the inn uh, was the hot and duty place for a male to work then as well. Uh, but uh, one of the very, or well, the only females uh, in that trade at that time in our Navy. So I've traveled around the world quite a bit, uh, around 40 countries I would have been to, but my favorite place in the world is Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, can't, can't go anywhere better. I am married to Craig and uh, my two sons are 12 and 10. And uh, hopefully they don't pop in during this, um, this call and tell me that they're hungry. Um, I think a, a key challenge for me and um, in the last 12 months has been, um, of course, COVID. Um, and, you know, on reflection is maintaining, how do we maintain our resilience, uh, but without stepping on someone else. So being able to hold each other up and um, carry each other along rather than uh, pushing anyone else down. So, um, you know, things can get tight economically and how do we continue to move forward together uh, on not just on International Women's Day, but every day uh, as women. Thank you, Thank Kirsten. You. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, um, I'd like to now invite um, you, Mark, um, to enter the conversation. Mark is um, the CEO of PwC and four and a half years in that role um, with a corporate finance um, and mergers and acquisitions background, Mark. Um, you've steer an organisation with 250,000 employees across 124 countries. Um, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big multifaceted ship that you run with enormous influence in um, the lives of um, all those in leadership roles um, and in particular uh, women. I wonder if you might um, comment a little bit um, on the the issues that you've been championing as the CEO of, at PwC and the business imperative for diversity in the uh, professional services world. Welcome, Mark. Uh, well, thanks, Kirsten. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, yeah, look, as you've mentioned, uh, been in the role for four and a half years. Uh, and um, obviously, PwC New Zealand, um, we are only part of that global network. We've got 1,800 people here in New Zealand and 135 partners. Um, and I, I suppose um, probably for me, um, one of the key uh, things that um, you know, I'm sort of thinking about today is that um, you know, when you look at the importance of accelerating gender equality, uh, there's no doubt that that's absolutely gaining momentum and that the expectation and the pressure on leaders to take action uh, and, and model those sort of behaviours is uh, increasing the whole time. So. Um, you know, it is, um, you know, when we think about it, uh, you know, from our perspective, um, I probably always try and bring it back a little bit to, you know, the why, what, why is it important? Um, and I think that, um, you know, for us, um, you know, as a significant organisation, as an employer, um, for us, you know, we've got to make sure that we have, you know, we attract and retain the right people um, and that we're all representative of, you know, our clients um, and the people that we interact with us. So, when I sort of think about, you know, creating a, um, a DNI culture, uh, and again, DNI is is broader than just gender, um, but it does bring back it bring in some of those other aspects which are so important in terms of creating that inclusive uh, culture. With you know, clearly gender being really important, but for us, um, you know, it is massively important to to ensure that we do provide that environment. So that when I think about it, it's not just um, you know, it's why our people want to come and join us and, and stay with us. Um, and also why our clients sort of want to want to work for us, and and then you know sort of bring it back to purpose as well. You know, I also do think that you know as a, um, a big employer employer here in New Zealand, it is absolutely part of our responsibility to you know, ensure that we you know create and influence change. And um, probably you know a couple of reflections in terms of driving that change you know, over the last four and a half years is that you know for me um, it's you know what measures you know typically gets done. Um, but a really important aspect of that is also intervention so that, um, you know, as a leader, we've got to make sure that our, you know, our, our leadership team, we challenge some of the decision making we have so that we can, that we can drive change. And when again, I sort of come back to, you know, choose to challenge the theme of today, 
um, probably the other big message would be how important it is, you know, to get on the pitch uh, and be prepared to have a voice on the topic so that you can, you know, look to provide that culture, that environment that everyone can speak up and, and drive and, and crystallise change. So uh, it's great to be part of today's discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, um, Mark. Um, and now, Paula, if I might um, uh, bring you into the conversation. Paula is the Disability uh, Commissioner for New Zealand, um, a lawyer, um, yeah, a background in law and also in, in policy, in particular in the justice sec sec uh, sector, Paula, um, an elite athlete as well for many years as a Paralympian um, and often uh, in our conversation referred to your time on the bike um, leading, Paula. Um, I wondered if you might, um, Tell us a little bit about your background, Paula, and particularly the work that you're doing as the Disability Commissioner. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, kia ora tātou, ko Paula Tisariro, tōku ingoa, ko Otehoatanga mō te kāhui, tikitangata ki o te aro, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I'm Paula, and I'm the Disability Rights Commissioner, which is a statutory function under the Human Rights Act. And the primary focus of the role is to protect and promote the rights of disabled people. I also hold some roles in the sports sector separate to my role. And one is I serve on the New Zealand Sports Tribunal hearing disputes. And secondly, I'm the chef de mission for the New Zealand Paralympic team heading to Tokyo later this year. I wanna just provide a little bit of context about disability in New Zealand. So 24% of our population are disabled. Disability can be anything from a physical impairment to neurodiversity to sensory conditions, learning difficulties and mental distress. Some people experience multiple impairments and like women, we're not a homogenous group of people, and I think it's really, really important. And one of the things that I wanted to bring to, today, to today's discussion is that women are not a homogenous group. And it's really, really important that when we talk about how far women have come globally, that we are mindful and deliberate about making sure that that includes all women. I talk about people being disabled because that reflects the social model of disability, which says people are not disabled by their impairments, but actually we are disabled by society, by the infrastructure, the policies and services that are set up. And it reminds us of that collective responsibility that we have to remove those barriers. So thinking about International Women's Day and the theme of choosing to challenge, I've been giving a lot of thought to, to challenging two things. One is challenging ableism, which is a word we don't talk about very often. And secondly, choosing to challenge violence and abuse, which unfortunately is still a very significant issue for women and a very significant issue for disabled women and girls. So I just wanna to touch firstly on this idea of ableism, which we might have an opportunity to talk about further. But it is an ism that we don't talk about in New Zealand. And it has a really disproportionate effect on women and girls. So ableism is essentially the barriers that are physical and non-physical that society places in the way of disabled people's lives. At a structural level, it's about the systems that exclude and devalue disabled people. And it's really important because it's one of the con big contributors to some of the outcomes that disabled women currently face. And I'll just touch on a couple of those. Firstly, around employment, education and training. Disabled women are the most marginalized in New Zealand's labor market. 48% of disabled women earn less than 30,000 per year. Disabled women are less likely to be in full-time employment and disabled women bear a disproportionate burden of poverty. I wanna to touch on violence and abuse. As I said today, I've been quite public out there in my social media feeds, choosing to challenge violence and abuse. 
because disabled people experience this conservatively twice the rate of non-disabled people rising to three times for children and four to 10 times for sexual violence towards disabled women and girls. And we don't talk about it. And so today I really want us to challenge that. I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. There are many of these barriers that exist, which perpetuate the outcomes that many disabled people face. And so for me today, it's really about thinking about disabled women and girls in the context of International Women's Day and making sure that we all collectively across our business and our education system, across our organizations, that we are really thinking about bringing all women along on the journey. So namahi nui, I'm looking forward to discussing with my awesome panelists. Kia ora, thank you so much, um, uh, Paula, for your opening remarks. Um, in fact, the first question we were going to address as a group was the size of the problem. And I was thinking I would throw to you to begin with, Paula, um, you've started answering that. Um, the child poverty report and statistics um, is another matter as well, um, particularly for disabled women. Um, you have mentioned to me that disabled um, uh, children um, uh, are as, uh, more, four times more likely um, to, to live in poverty and also that um, sexual violence against um, disabled women is ex extensively more pro prolific than the general population. Did you want to share a little bit more about um, that particular report and um, what we can do um, to address some of these um, worrying statistics? Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, you know, for a long time in New Zealand, we relied on global data to inform us a lot about the sort of state of the nation really in New Zealand around disability. But increasingly, we are getting much better data and evidence. And so there have been some reports which have come out, which have really shone the light on um, the critical need to address some of the inequalities that disabled people face. And you touched on the child um, poverty stats, which showed that uh, disabled children are more likely to live in homes of poverty and disabled parents will often be in a situation uh, of poverty. And of course that has uh, flow on impacts. And I touched on some of the violence and abuse stats, but it, you know, it, it doesn't end there. I could talk easily about the right to health and you know, research suggests that people with intellectual disabilities don't access publicly funded breast or cervical screening programs um, to the same degree as non-disabled women. You know, we know about the right to housing and the fact that only 2% of our housing stock in New Zealand is accessible, yet one in six people require some sort of modification to their homes. And I think that, you know, there are a number of really big policy areas where disabled people are falling far behind non-disabled people. And, you know, there's lots of work going on in various parts to address that. But I think it's really important on a day like today to really think about what can we all collectively do, particularly with COVID uh, you know, helping us to reimagine the future and to think about what we can do differently. And I, I guess there's a real opportunity today to be thinking about those things, how we can respond to the challenges ahead of us and how we can do so much better. Because unfortunately, disabled people really fall behind in so many of our key stats mm -hmm. and we need to grow and empower our population. Mm -hmm. I wanted to throw um, or invite you, Melissa, to perhaps reflect on some of the comments Paula has made in respect of the Navy around ableism, um, but also um, thinking about your workforce. I mean, you've got 2,300 um, 
military officers plus the civilian reserves. This, um, this issue must be um, um, topical for you in your organisation. Um, yeah, we uh, we have in the Navy 2,300 or, or thereabouts of uh, officers and, and sailors. Uh, that, that doesn't include the civilian workforce and our reserves that we uh, re rely so heavily on. Um, if I, um, and I'll, I'll try and answer the, the question that's come up in the Q&A as well at the same time, uh, but, but talking about um, equality or equity um, in the same at the same time is um, if I if I think back to my early time in the Navy um, I think we try to fit in in the military was um, pretty pretty standard when we first started to uh, go to sea on ships and, and being one of the boys and um, answering the Q&A question, you know, that's really uh, was a tough time trying to fit in and be one of the boys, but that's what you had to do in order to uh, succeed or, or to survive, I would say. Um, and at some point in time though, in, in my time, I, I realized that I was never going to be a boy or a man. So uh, the way, I was working was never going to be sustainable because it just wasn't me. And so I had to switch to, to doing things that the way that I thought was the best way um, to succeed and to do a job. And, and then I started to actually find value in that because it was a different way of uh, working. Um, I think what the Navy did then was we went through a phase of this uh, gender integration, which was uh, trying to change some things to allow um, women to be able to succeed and not have to survive. And, you know, small things such as, um, you know, having male and female bathrooms or unisex bathrooms, they re really small things, but um, it was really called gender integration. Um, and I think now we're kind of at a stage where we've gone past gender integration. And now we're more into the organization changing. So in order to bring people into uh, an organization, then it's the organization that has to change, not the women or no, not the, the person. Uh, so I think um, uh, that one might answer the Q&A question, but um, yeah. If I can interject for a moment, Melissa, you had to take some pretty big risks though to fight for gender integration, particularly around things such as uniforms, right? That's right, and uh, there were some, you know, it's really tactical and, and small things that at the time you didn't know they were gonna make such big changes, but uh, uniforms for females uh, didn't exist for, for quite a long time. You just, um, well, well, they weren't the same as the men, so they weren't practical. So for instance, we had to wear skirts uh, or, or dresses on board ships, which um, are not very pragmatic. And, and you weren't allowed to, to wear those, um, you weren't allowed to wear shorts, for instance, when you went ashore. Uh, and there was, you know, you, to make the change, you had to break the rules. And so there were times when I broke the rules, uh, knowing that I'd get in trouble. Um, but what it did was start to highlight some of the inequalities and, and actually the, the, um, impractical nature of some of those uniforms in the early days mm. and so change came. Just on the uniform aspect um, I'm, I'm wondering in sport more broadly has this been something that's cropped up in in cricket Martin? Uh, it's been a major issue funnily enough I'm listening to Melissa thinking 
exactly the same thing. We would, we would for years uh, provide women's teams with gear that had been created for male teams. And, um, you know, it not only wasn't appropriate, it, it wasn't comfortable or practical. That's been part of a major change that's occurred um, in recent times is, is making, making women and girls when they're playing cricket feel good about what they're actually wearing. Sounds so simple. Certainly does. Um, and, and that's good to celebrate the gains along the way as, as well as um, at this moment where we're looking forward at, at, at the size of the problem ahead. Um, I wondered if we might just touch on, um, we, you know, we've, we've, we've touched on um, some of the issues that Paul has raised, but there's another question here. Not all women um, obviously have equal access um, to opportunities in their lives. Um, Melissa, back to you again. Um, in the um, Navy, you have quite strong um, representation of Māori and Pacifica officers. Is that, is that correct? But, but what are your reflections on um, how they are placed throughout uh, the hierarchical structure and, uh, and, and we'll touch on governance as well of the organisation. So the Navy has uh, about 20% Māori and 5% Pacifica, so 25% um, of our workforce is Māori Pacifica, which is a, a really good number. Um, but most of those uh, Māori and Pacifica sit in, the, in our sailor rather than our officer corps and therefore they're not in the, a lot of the decision-making uh, roles. So um, it's a bit like the gender pay gap in, in the Defence Force or, and in the Navy. We'll see a lot of, uh, we all get paid the same uh, in the public service. So in the Navy, we get paid depending on which uh, trade we might be in rank. And so you'll see our gender pay gap is actually about how many uh, people or how many women or Māori or Pacifica are in those uh, higher paid, which are warfare and engineering roles and, and the decision-making roles, which are the officer roles. Uh, and um, a lot of our uh, women, for instance, in the Navy are in more of the um, clerical roles that or logistics roles that are not paid as much. So that's where we'll see our gender pay gap. Uh, and, the, and the same is with uh, Māori and Pacifica. So um, our Māori and Pacifica women sit in that area as well. Mm. Mark, I might invite you to join the conversation. Um, you've achieved something extraordinary, which uh, uh, PwC, which is 50-50% women and men at a partner, lev uh, partner level. Is that correct? No? Hello. Um, if only. If only. So, so we're 50-50 up to senior manager level. Um, and then unfortunately it drops off pretty quickly. We're down to around 30% or a third at the director level and down to 20% um, at, the, at the partner level of, of, of female. And um, these cultural issues um, that we're touching on for um, Māori and Pacifica women, you've, you've had um, some very intense experiences with your partners in America. Um, you had um, a, a policewoman shot fatally, one of your employees, um, not that long ago. Your organisation's been... Um, thrown into a more intense dialogue around um, uh, cultural equity and representation in your organisation. Could you share a little bit about that journey with us? Yeah, look, um, so, so that incident you know, sadly happened in, in 2016. And um, I suppose that was um, a catalyst for a you know, big injection of focus around you know, our participation in the Black Lives Matter movement. And, Last year, uh, last week, actually, we had our US um, chairman talking to a few of us here in New Zealand. And uh, again, I think it sort of comes back to, um, you know, um, having the, um, you know, the, the, the presence and, and um, leading the conversation around what's right. And, I, I, and in that case, what was definitely wrong. 
Um, and, and I suppose um, my reflection on that is a, a great sort of example as to um, you know, openly talking as leaders um, across the group about how it feels and, and how it's wrong and, and, and that, you know, as a, again, as a large employer, we, we should be having a voice, you know, on that. And, um, you know, addressing Māori and Pacifica here in New Zealand um, is a big focus for us because, you know, as I said earlier, it's very important that we have the representation, you know, that's attractive to our people and, and our clients. Um, and we've sort of sought to do that and, you know, probably a, a story to, to sort of tell briefly is, you know, um, late last year we admitted our first female um, Pacifica partner and also our first female Māori partner. Um, and, and what that, do, that did was give us the opportunity to celebrate um, in, in those two cultures, uh, you know, in, 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 in their own way, you know, the carver ceremony, the, the, the whakatau, in terms of having that and bringing um, if you like, those two cultures inside our organisation, inside our offices, um, and openly sharing and, and, and celebrating. So again, I think that um, you know, it's an example that we're, um, you know, we need to go to make progress. We've got to, you know, have those employee network groups where we, we embrace the cultures uh, and encourage that because you know, our people certainly got a lot out of that. Uh, and you know, we got some fantastic um, you know, feedback as to how motivating and inspirational it was um, to see people come through you know, as leaders um, and for that to be celebrated. So it's about um, you know, looking to embrace um, you know, the, the cultures within our organisation and, and certainly it's not asking uh, them to change, it's for us to change, to embrace and, and welcome um, you know, the, the, their life in, 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 into the world that we, that we have as, in, in, you know, in business. I wanted to invite you also, Mark, to share a little bit about your work practices that have enabled the growth of women in management roles as well, because um, um, they're very, you know, really quite progressive. Um, and um, it, yeah, it'd be great if you could share a little bit about what you've achieved there. Yeah, look, I'm happy to talk um, a bit about that. I, I suppose um, in terms of progress, um, you know, to do that, you've got to, I mentioned before, you know, in, in, in my experience, um, intervene and, and, and challenge ourselves. Um, so we've certainly been um, big uh, adopters and advocates of the 40-40-20. Uh, champions of change, so that when we look um, at promotions, um, you know, we do bring that lens, you know, 40% female, 40% male, and, 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 and the balance, you know, either way. So again, looking to make sure we've got the right representation there. Um, I think it's, um, you know, the flexible working environment that we've been, you know, big advocates of, you know, we've had a workplace strategy to, to make the physical environment, you know, right, but also, to totally em, 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 embrace flexible working, and we've certainly seen um, you know, massive progress uh, a, a, across that. Um, and then, you know, in terms of developing some of the thinking, you know, we have challenged ourselves with some of the unconscious bias, and we do bring a degree of rigor into sort of those key decision-making processes around recruitment and promotions to make sure there's lens. So it's it's really speaking openly about it um, you know, and as leaders calling each other out and challenging each other to make sure that we can drive you know the uh, the change um, you know in, in the direction that we want to so it's not any particular thing it's a combination of a range of things to to to, to make you know progress uh, you know as, as quickly as we can um, just thinking about governance before I, I let you go um, mark um, I'm wondering about quotas, and it's come up in a number of our conversations um, when we've we've talked about um, governance um, in the in in the legal profession where I'm from in Australia. Um, it's been active for some time. You have a background as a lawyer. Um, is it is it something as as to you, Paula, as well? Is it something that um, you've advocated for? Um, uh, in your own organisation and, um, you know, what are the pros and cons there? Yes, yeah, so, so look, um, there's, there's a balance, isn't there? So, so certainly um, a big advocate of, you know, what gets measured um, gets focused on. Um, and we have had principles, you know, like the 40, 40, 20, you know, that we have measured and, we, and we've used in our decision making. And, and one of the, um, so, so I'm a big believer in targets. Um, and you know, and 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 driving change through that. You know, one of the the challenges with a quota is it can be a single date or a single period, 
and that if you're, you know, depending on, you know, for example, there could be a cohort of partners you're thinking of bringing through into the partnership, um, and but there might be another cohort, you know, in, in, in the next six months or 12 months away. So you've got to look at over, you know, a defined time period. So, um, you know, or a measurable time period, but also short enough to make change, but not be a single day. So I'm probably a strong advocate of targets, um, you know, based on, you know, some pretty clear uh, objectives, um, but but falling slightly short of the actual quota thing, which you know could have the the situation of a suboptimal business decision, you know, based on the uh, mass, you know, on, on on a single day or a single event. Paula, just drawing you into the conversation a little bit too. I mean, you spent many uh, uh, some years um, in the legal profession. Um, putting on that hat, could you um, perhaps? share some insights into women in the law? Oh, I, I think it's a long time since I practiced law, but I, I certainly, you know, it's very much a, a very um, um, similar sort of description that Mark had around, you know, up to a certain point, um, including sort of law graduates is very much a, um, you know, a, a good female cohort. And then as, you know, People get more senior in the profession um, that, you know, that can change, notwithstanding that, you know, the Chief Justice is a female and, and some other key leadership roles in the broader justice sector are held by females. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things I'd really like to, to touch on, um, Kirsten, is one of the things that I often talk about is that, you know, if organisations are not doing disability, then organisations are not doing diversity. And, you know, for me, one of the things I sort of talked about at the start of this was around women not being a homogenous group. And while it is really great, of course, to have targets to increase um, participation of females, I think it is really important to have a conversation about, um, you know, that intersectionality between if you're a female and you're disabled, or if you're female and Māori or Pacific, or female and part of the rainbow community, you know, those multiple layers of identities can, you know, create real barriers for people. And so I'd really encourage people when thinking about those targets for female participation to dig a bit deeper and think about, and you know, the, the case that I will always be promoting is, um, you know, making sure that disability is very much part of the diversity strategy because 24% of the population uh, in New Zealand you know that's a huge segment of the market share and segment of um, untapped talent in the employment market and sometimes you have to be deliberate to attract that talent because it does require a bit of a different way of thinking about recruitment and um, um, so forth so I just I think it, it's really important to think about um, that that sort of you know deeper dive to different population groups rather than this idea that it, it's all just about a homogenous group of women. Mm. Paula, we've got 128 or more people listening right now, um, and a number of those will be leaders in employment, um, making employment decisions, and I imagine might be keen to also hear from you what um, what they can do, what we can do. Um, to ensure we are recruiting for diversity um, across the board, um, including people with disabilities. Do you have some pointers you might um, like to share? Uh, thanks, Kirsten. I think just, you know, very quickly, it is about having some deliberate aims in that area, including it in organisational strategies. I think it's about, you know, getting professional advice around what a good recruitment process looks like, whether you're open to doing things differently around, for example, um, whether you will always 
insist on an interview or actually might there be some other way of assessing a person's um, skill set. I think it's also about um, you know, understanding the myths around employment and disability. And there's a great resource um, called the um, Disability Toolkit. And MSD, um, you can find this on their website, but they've done a really good job at breaking down the myths around disability, like, for example, that it costs more to hire disabled people. Well, actually, that's been proven time and time again. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, and so many other myths that are broken down. It, that talk, it really helps um, leaders, I think, to understand how to, to do better um, in this space. But I think it's also really important to think about who's around your governance table. You know, are there disabled mm -hmm. people? And, um, you know, are you involving disabled people in in the work that you do, even if they're not employees? So how are you designing your products and services? Mm -hmm or, you know, quarter of the population. So I think, you know, employment is, is such, a, you know, um, an enabler of, you know, being able to, to live a good life. And so really important that we, we do concentrate um, lifting, lifting that. Martin, um, this point about intersectionality, uh, which which Paul has raised um, for um, in, you know in building inclusive um, uh, um, cultures, um, is this something that you're tackling? I mean, women in cricket. Um, what what's on the horizon there? Is this is intersectionality something you've been addressing in your organisation? Yeah, we we are starting to, but I have to say. To start with, it was somewhat accidental in the sense that we started with a really strong focus on, on significantly increasing the presence and influence of females within cricket governance. As we started to make really strong progress in that, what we started to see was um, diversity start to appear in terms of um, uh, ethnicity and, and better representation of different um, ethnic makeup uh, from around New Zealand cricket. Um, and, you know, even just a, a lovely example right now is that the New Zealand Cricket Board sits there with eight directors and one president, uh, five, five of the nine are female, um, uh, two are gay, um, and two directors have really strong iwi heritage. So we didn't set out for that intersectionality, but it, it sort of came. And then once we started to recognise it, we started to much better value it. And I think what Paul said a minute ago is so right, is that um, when you find yourself in that position, then the next step is to actually do something deliberate that forces you to go forward. And so calling it out in your strategy, uh, making sure that you are committing yourselves um, to doing things that will ultimately result in that um, happening. Uh, is the way forward. If you if you just leave it completely to chance, it might happen a little bit accidentally, but that'll peter out after a while. You've got to pick up on that momentum and and build on that deliberately. Have we ever seen a woman um, lead a cricket organisation in New Zealand? Person, you know the answer to that because I told you <laughs> the other day. Um, there, there has been. Cricket associations existing in New Zealand um, for more than a hundred years, um, there has never once been a female as CEO um, of a cricket association in New Zealand. So um, <laughs> that's a fairly sizable gap that we could probably do something about. And which I think that the approach that I explained to you the other day that we're taking is we've made huge progress in governance, we've made huge progress on the front line, those employed within cricket. Um, what we haven't done yet is fill that, and I think Melissa might have touched on this, fill in that really uh, clear opportunity for promotion and senior management, including CEO roles. So we're now taking quite a deliberate approach to um, the development of, of female talent, right from the latter year, years of school through to, to the point where they can become CEOs. And, and so what we're trying to do is eliminate 
uh, anyone that has the excuse that we don't have females who are good enough to do this by making sure that we have a steady flow of females that are more than capable of doing this. How do we um, grow um, male champions of gender equity, Martin? Um, <laughs> I think, I think one other thing, and I'll say something that's a little bit controversial here, is that I have found sometimes that when I've involved myself in this movement, um, that in some ways the behaviour towards me occasionally has been uh, really reflective of exactly the type of behaviour that the groups are trying to get rid of. Um, and I think it's, you know, sign of maturity will be when uh, people really enjoy whoever it is that is champion change and, and allows them to participate um, equitably in it. It sounds ridiculous coming out of the mouth of a male in this conversation, but it's um, there's a bit of truth there still about uh, the movement has to mature. I might just invite any response um, from the panel to what Martin said. Does anyone want to jump in? So in the Defence Force, it's, it's really key to have those uh, male champions of change. Um, and when we uh, started to have women on um, operational uh, or warships, um, it did take a lot of, um, uh, I guess, guts to make some of those decisions uh, to make that big change. And, you know, I really have to thank those that came before me to make changes like that. Now, some of them may have been driven a lot by um, uh, the New Zealand community and then um, the politicians, but to make it happen um, had to take a lot of guts. And uh, so how do we grow more of those people? Um, you know, sometimes I, I do it uh, really poorly in that, um, if someone uh, has, does have a bit of a challenge around why we might have more women on a course than men or invite more women to something than men. Um, and that I will sometimes say, well, you know, the reason we do it is because, for instance, I have two sons and they could, they could just go through life and, um, and they will be successful. But your daughters, they will have to try harder to beat my sons, even though they work much harder and they um, you know, will try much harder than my sons. My sons will still get the role ahead of them right now. Um, and you know, I shouldn't really uh, s stop that maybe. It makes it easy for my sons to succeed in the future, but that's not the way it needs to be in the future. You know, if my sons don't pull their weight, they don't get the role. Uh, but I think right now, you know, the, we need the male champions who have daughters and who have nieces and um, to stand up and say, yeah, I want my daughter or my niece to succeed um, without having to put extra effort in or without having to knock down a few more barriers to get to the role that they deserve or to be able to thrive in an organisation and not have to survive in the organisation. Mm. So, um, you know, take a risk and be a male champion. I'm going to invite our um, audience to, to pop any questions you might have as we're talking into the um, chat, the Q&A. Um, we'll start to pick up some of those um, as we go along and we might just drift into Q&A um, naturally even. Um, You've brought something up which is um, top of mind for me at the moment, which is the kind of leadership qualities we need for this particular moment in time. And I was um, chatting with CEO of Leadership New Zealand, um, incoming CEO Anya Sathyana, um, a week ago, and she said to me, uh, leaders today need to be the hospice for the world that is dying and the midwives for the world that is coming into being. Um, and that women were best placed to fill those roles. Um, clearly picking up um, both um, the context of um, the COVID 
era that we inhabit uh, and it's all of the economic and social and uh, well-being challenges that it has brought um, right across all industries and spheres. Um, but also the fact that we um, are at a point in time in the coming to the mid the mid part of this century with a uh, climate catastrophe um, in our hands um, that we hold responsibility for. Um, I wondered um, if um, I might um, invite the panel to reflect on the kinds of leaders we need to be growing right now and the leadership qualities which our organisations um, uh, need us to be uh, demonstrating. Um, Paula, you want to jump in? You're nodding. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> Nodding, nodding in, in agreement with the sentiment. I think that, you know, never before, you know, um, have we needed excellent leaders like we do now with the challenges in front of us. And I think, you know, reflecting on COVID, you know, one of the things that's become very apparent to us is, you know, are the inequities that glow, that um, COVID has shone the light on. And so I think leaders who can think about that and think about how to address um, inequalities is, is really critical and, and leaders at the political level, you know, right across the political spectrum at um, central and local government um, who, who can think about that real challenge around equity. I think that, you know, it goes without saying, but, you know, COVID really has um, taught us that we can, we can do things differently. And I personally think the real challenge for leaders is sustaining that and being brave and bold enough to continue doing things differently. So if I think about the disability community, you know, I've heard so many stories over the years about disabled people whose employers would not create the very sort of flexibility that suddenly when we had to create it as a nation because of COVID, we could. And then we all talked about, let's stay in this together. And yet often I, you know, am hearing that actually people sort of want to return to how it was. And I think there is a real challenge there. You know, if I think about the size of the problem and some of the stats that I talked about um, in my opening comments, you know, if we want to really address the huge employment gap for disabled people, then actually the flexibility, the ability to work from home from time to time and to do things differently and rely on technology in a different way is something that leaders really, really could be embracing. Um, and I think, you know, another really big leadership quality is around the being able to lead people during times of uncertainty. And, you know, I think the last year there's been so much uncertainty and, you know, good, clear communications and being able to, to lead through certainty. And I think the other one finally, I mean, there are many, but the other one finally I'll comment on, I, I think is around this idea of empathy and, and understanding. Um, you know, one of the things that COVID also um, gave many non-disabled people um, an opportunity to learn about leadership, I think, was that, you know, for this moment in time, non-disabled people were isolated at home, had minimal engagement in their community, relied on technology to access work, and had to rely on others. And actually, that's how many disabled people live lives because of the barriers that are that exist. And so actually thinking about what we all learned during that time and how we can create a more accessible world, I think is a great challenge for many of our leaders. Melissa, um, tell us what happened for you on the naval base when the first lockdown happened in March. There wasn't a lot of warning. Um, so we have a quite a young population in the Navy. Uh, we had quite a lot of 18 to 24 year olds who are living on the Naval base. Um, and so that was a, quite a, a challenge, especially for people who are um, quite active. So they are really active and they want to get out there and go for a run and do physical training. Um, and 
and they've been staying in their, been able to, or, or staying in their room uh, and doing something in their room became really tough um, for our population. And, and so that um, building resilience, and you know, I, I like hearing what Paula said that actually that's how it is for people with disabilities all the time, you know, trying to find um, uh, a different way of doing things. That's, that's their norm. So it'd be uh, interesting, you know, now to, you know, I, I see something in common here that we could, uh, we could have leveraged of, of how to keep pigs on their own. But what we did do was um, we enabled the Wi-Fi on a base to be free. So normally it's paid for. So um, it's paid by individuals, but that then kept um, people busy because they were able to access what they needed to in their rooms without having to go out and uh, um, contact or, or engage with others. And then they had to also um, do their physical training together online and not as groups that they were used to. So, you know, there was, there was a lot of innovation that, that occurred during that time uh, and, um, and, and some which I think will be useful going forward. Yeah, um, it must have been a real, a real challenge to do nothing for such a service-oriented um, organisation. Um, um, this question around digital equity, I imagine that's something that's come up for PwC, Mark. Um, yeah, look, I think um, it's been a, a massive um, you know, change in terms of the way that we've operated. Um, you know, clearly um, having technology that was proven, you know, as we went into the first lockdown, um, you know, has been, uh, you know, has been what I would say one of the unintended benefits of, of COVID. So that, um, you know, we've all got confidence working virtually, working with technology, um, but that's fine, you know, when you've got it. Um, so as our organisation, you know, it's, it's been, um, I think, a big step forward in terms of the way that we embrace flexible working, the way that, um, you know, we probably have a better understanding of some of the challenges that, um, you know, our colleagues are having at home, whether you're trying to work and manage children or have a dog that's barking as you're on the screen, all, all those sorts of things and the empathy, the empathy that, um, that Paula talked around. Um, but it probably is a, you know, it's societally, it is a, it is a growing issue. You know, those that have technology, those that have the opportunity, uh, you know, to, um, you know, to, to, to operate in that world. And, and when you look at it, you know, we've probably even observed it through our children, haven't we? Such, at some schools, it's been far easier to operate virtually, um, you know, and, and have the technology. And so at a societal level, I do think that the longer we're in the sort of environment that we are going to need to, you know, address that, you know, that social inequity, uh, you know, that, that can come out of the digital world. And it's probably particularly relevant um, yeah, in, the, in that schooling environment. <laughs> yes, and I wonder if I could get a point um, yeah. to what I said before around that sort of leading in uncertain times. And I, I've sort of been reflecting on this in my role as chef de mission for the uh, Paralympic team. And this sort of sense that, you know, everybody involved with Paralympic sport um, in New Zealand is really trying to ensure that our, our athletes are doing, um, you know, feel supported and can continue training and can work towards this goal, um, you know, in the knowledge of, of some degree of um, uncertainty around the global situation. And I think, you know, what I've come to really reflect on as a leader is, um, really getting people to think about leading with the information that we have with us right now. And to me, that's a bit of a change because I've always been, you know, sort of thinking about the, the impossible and how you, how you do that. But I've, I've come to think that actually there's a degree of, you know, leading and really leading in the sense of this is the information that we know and we understand now. And so how can we lead and pull people along in, an, in that environment of, of uncertainty? And I, I think that's certainly been a, a change in my own leadership reflection over the past year. I, I think we saw something I think was really neat 
over the last couple of weeks, although I bet it didn't feel like it for this leader, was the, the um, principal of Papatoi High School having to balance um, you know, what was happening right across New Zealand and a focus in on, on his school, but at the same time, uh, try and help his school community feel safe, feel informed, feel like they could do what they could now. You know, that might sound pretty straightforward, but, but I read an article in the Herald um, on Saturday morning about it and, and to understand that, that, you know, there's seven or eight different languages spoken in that school. So getting simple information through wasn't simple. And, um, and I just love the philosophy that that person took to, um, you know, trying to do the right thing for New Zealand, but try to really look after his own community. And then when he felt that there was some undue pressure on his community, standing up for them and um, being prepared to effectively, you know, take on the Prime Minister in terms of uh, what he felt was uh, undue pressure. You're nodding there, Melissa. Um... What are you thinking? Um, it's the the leading in uncertain times is um, is something we we do in the military. We train for um, leading firstly and then leading in uncertain times. So, um, but it, it's amazing how much I've learned from others that are not in the military and you do mention the, the principal um, in Papa Toi Toi. And you know, there, there's so many great examples of um, how in the military we can learn from so many others uh, and how they lead. Uh, I think what's really important though is this um, doing it together as well. So the, um, the COVID response did bring together a number of government agencies um, and there are times when we can often protect our patch and, you know, we don't like to cross into someone else's swim lane, but COVID meant we all had to um, swim in each other's lane at some time and then figure it out as we went along. Uh, and it really worked well and it's something uh, we could really do a lot more of in the future. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to now address a couple of questions um, that have come through. One on our Q&A has been sitting there um, patiently for a little while. What are the key values or two key values that you have lived by during your career um, progression that has kept you grounded? Um, anyone want to jump in there with an answer? Look, uh, I'm happy to sort of lead off um, there. Look, um, probably a couple of things that sort of spring to mind. One would be, um, it, it's all about the team uh, and, and not the individual. And that, um, you know, if you're actively participating as part of a team, you know, you're probably f far more likely to be successful and, and have more fun along the way. Mm. Um, and, and then, um, you know, the other aspect is, is, is be yourself. Um, and that, uh, you know, if you, if, if you bring yourself, um, again, you're going to be more authentic uh, and you can't fake it forever. So, uh, you know, again, it's, um, you know, better to, to, to bring yourself. So that'd be my two to kick off. Thanks, Mark. Paula? Happy, happy to go next. I think um, it's, a, it's a great question. And I, I think one of the things for me is around looking after our whole selves as leaders to sort of, you know, nourish our energy levels. And so, you know, for me, um, you know, it's about um, family. So my husband and, and our three wonderful children. Um, it's about riding my bike <laughs> um, and, you know, spending time with friends and, and you know, looking after our, our whole selves so that we can re-energize and, and bring the best of, of ourselves um, to our leadership roles. And, and I know for me that, you know, if I get this sort of real frustrated sense of I need to ride my bike, I, I need time with family, for me, that's a bit of a cue that, that things have got a little bit out of whack. And so for me, that's that sense of, looking after our our whole selves um, and I think the other key you know really for me is 
The other thing that keeps me really grounded is making sure I check in and, and, and listen to the community of people that I serve um, because it is very easy to just, you know, <laughs> go, um, but actually just stopping and, and listening and recalibrating where I need to is something that keeps me grounded. So a couple of thoughts from me. Thanks, uh, uh, Paula. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting question here from Christy Hutt, um, which, um, which says this. She says, I love what you're saying about culture, but what, what advice do you have for people to be inclusive of all women leaders? Um, and I believe we all have different layers. And recently I was referred to as a white woman by a Maori leader who was explaining to me the importance of culture Although I do have Māori blood, and yes, I look white, it worries me that going forward, my skin colour will disadvantage me. How do we be, how do recruiters be inclusive if they see a white woman as white? I think it's worth discussing diversity, not just colour. Um, not an unfamiliar issue in my own organisation, actually. Um, does anyone want to tackle that? It's a big topic, isn't it? Um, I think in the... In the defence wars, we used to uh, well, you know, the the culture keepers are our middle middle management, um, and they're also though the culture cultivators. So they are where the um, the culture is uh, lives, breeds, um, and that, and it's really important that our our middle layer of our organisation. Um, understands where the leadership want to go because they're the ones that are teaching the next uh, layer down or our our new recruits. So um, turning keepers of the culture, which could be um, both good and bad parts of a culture, to become cultivators of the culture of where the organisation wants to come, go becomes really important. Um, now that you know that that does mean you need to have quite a diverse group and you, you often need to have some tension in the in the group of you're not all going to see the same thing when you're looking at the same thing it's going to be a different perspective so you um you know the diversity is not just gender and um skin color but it, it's diversity of thought um i think that's the most important thing is now, what is the diversity you have around the table? And, and the, the diversity of thought often comes from having a different gender or um, you know, different experience background, uh, which could include your um, ethnicity. Uh, it could in, include your, um, your sexuality or if you're disabled or able. Um, so I think, you know, trying to grow those cultivators of the culture in your in the middle layer, but being very clear where you want to go, and then um, you know being looking at that diversity um, and providing some clarity on that. Thank you so much, um, Melissa. Um, recognizing great women in our lives, I've got a question from my mother in Australia, who joins us today. Um, Thank you, Professor Ruth Weber, um, for writing in our chat bot. <laughs> um, um, Ruth, aka Mum, says, um, how do you get your staff and members of your organisation on board with inclusive policies and practices? And I should just close that um, Ruth is a professor of sociology and has been heavily engaged in um, influencing government on a whole range of policies, including in the disability sector. Um, I'll have to arrange an introduction, Paula, at some point. But to um, Ruth's question, um, how do we uh, get people on board? And um, I think early when we started, um, Martin, you mentioned that um, you had some pointers you wanted to share, particularly around how to break the barriers. Um. Uh, g'day, Mum. Um, firstly, in a direct answer to the question, I think it's got no chance unless the leaders themselves absolutely believe in it and consistently uh, follow the values and all the 
conversations and the decisions they make. If if they talk one way and and walk another way, then it's dead in the water. So uh, that's just, <laughs> and then secondly, I think um, it doesn't quite tie up, Kirsten, to be honest. But it's it, it, in terms of breaking through barriers, it's really about leaders being prepared to smash a few eggs to to actually um, achieve some progress sufficient to enable people to realize that that the leaders are really serious about the organization going in this direction and and then having you know created that sort of tension as Melissa said um, uh, then to make sure that things followed through so consistently you if you're not consistent in the direction that you're talking about then you've got no chance thank you so much and we are bang on 6 30 which i believe is my dong is that right um louise i'm about to hand the reins back to someone um for uh, closing comments and karakia there you are thank you agnes that's right. Um, kia ora koutou katoa. Look, uh, to our speakers, to you, Christine, um, look, much, much gratitude. Um, I think the diversity of thought, the kind of eclectic nature of the, scholar, of the conversations, um, well, I personally have really enjoyed it. But I do want to say a personal thanks to you, Mark, to you, Martin, to you, Christine, to you, Melissa, uh, to you, Paula, and to both our interpreters. Uh, there's been a couple of firsts for us today, um, which is always, is, is always, always really good. Um, I just want to say, look, you know, it is International Women's Day and it's been a, an amazing day. You know, I've had a great day of sitting on other panels and talking, had a, a bit of a disruptive interview with Duncan Gardner this morning. I'll have some words with him a little bit later. <laughs> it didn't kind of go as we wanted. Um, but I just wanted to share, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, share a little bit about what we're going to show you and then I'm going to say a, the karakia and then um, you know if you'd like to join us but as part of Global Women uh, we launched today um, a campaign and it was really focused on the motherhood penalty. Uh, we work with the Saatchi team and an international director in terms of coming up with um, some short 15 second videos uh, that kind of in a humorous way uh, get people to think about the motherhood penalty. Part of the intention is that although there is evidence and there is data, there is still not change. And so we're hoping that these kind of short things are a, a campaign that will at least start people to say, you know what, there is a real thing called penal the motherhood penalty. Uh, so to all of you, to those that joined us, you know, thank you. It's been a great day. So I will finish uh, with a karakia then. If you would like to watch the videos, uh, please stay. Alternatively, please visit the Global Women website. They are up there as well. Thank you. Uh, so if we just kind of take a moment and we'll say karakia. Kia tau, kia tato katoa, te atawhai o te tato araki o ihu karaiti. Me te aroha o te atua, me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu. Ake, ake, amene. Stay safe, stay well. If you can, watch the videos. Thank <laughs> you. 